Good morning. Our scripture passage this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20, on page 1506 in the Pew Bibles in front of you. And as you're turning there, speak, Lord, for your children are here listening. Hear these words from Matthew 5. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This week, to check out a hunch, I looked up driving, traffic driving statistics for the state of Michigan. And unfortunately for my hunch, Michigan State Police traffic data does not show an uptick in the number of car crashes in the last several years, although in other ways that's a really good thing. But somehow recently, I seem to be in the right place at the right time to witness a lot of near misses behind the wheel. Take the morning commute a couple of weeks ago on Burton Street. As cars were waiting in the line, opposing each other uh, in traffic, a car coming eastbound swerved up into the last place in line, erratically steered around the three cars in front of it into oncoming traffic, horn blaring, and carried on down Burton Street eastbound. When our kids asked, why was I not going forward in the car? I said, I'm trying to make sure we're not gonna get hit right now. I wished there had been a traffic officer around at the time. The driver of that zooming car both deserves my curiosity and needed some correction. Curiosity and generosity on my part because I have no idea what was going on for that driver. Maybe they're racing to get to a loved one's hospital bed. I don't know. Correction, because driving is a privilege, a responsibility. It can and does put other people in danger. A couple of weeks later, I noticed a radar speed sign when I was driving on Burton. It wasn't there before. I'm sure that the road incident that I witnessed and the placement of that sign were not directly correlated. But it made me wonder how effective a speed sign might have been at that intersection where I witnessed that incident. Maybe it would have helped, maybe not. Passing that sign and watching the traffic slow down accordingly in response to those bright orange letters reminds me that instant feedback is helpful for us in correcting our behavior. That flashing sign is a picture of the mirror function of God's law. John Calvin says God's law has three purposes. It's a teaching purpose, to teach us what God's will is, to restrain our misbehavior, and to show us a plan and a pattern for redeemed and grateful living. The law, Calvin says, is like a mirror. We look into it and contemplate our weakness, our sinfulness. We finally see the curse that comes from both of those things, just as a mirror shows us the spots on our faces. In our packed, short passage this morning, Jesus is speaking about his relationship to the law of God. Don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until any, everything is accomplished. So one thing we need to understand when we hear those words is what Jesus is talking about when he says the law and the prophets. Is he talking only about the commandments? Well, no. There he simply means the Old Testament scriptures, the law, the prophets, the writings received by the Jewish community as the word of God to them. It includes the commands, but isn't limited to them. He's trying to explain to the people listening to him that he's not anti-scripture, anti-God, anti-law. And here's why. Jesus has just spoken the Beatitudes to the crowd, to the disciples. He's just spoken what life looks like in this upside-down kingdom of heaven, where the spiritually poor are blessed, where the mourners receive comfort, where the peacemakers are, see God, where those who love him will be persecuted, where those who hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God and others will be filled. And further, Jesus has spoken about how that kind of a community, marked by those blessings, will not be able to remain hidden. Oh no, the life-giving witness of a community living by those blessings will show the current reality of God's now and future kingdom on display for all to see a witness received as a gift of life for some and coming in as a subversive challenge to the systems of the day. Such a vision without an appeal to scripture or the inherited tradition could lead some of the people around Jesus to wonder, is this rabbi preaching something totally new? Is he radical? By what authority is he teaching these things? So Jesus hurries to explain his relationship to the law and prophets, the Jewish scriptures. Nope, he's not anti-scripture. Nope, he hasn't come to cast off the Old Testament law, prophets, and writings. Instead, he's come to fill them up fill them full. In his teaching, he will reinterpret that Old Testament law. In his life, he will demonstrate a human life lived in complete obedience to God, the life that we were actually all created to have. As he does, he will claim a divine authority to do this new thing that's built on the foundation of the inherited scriptures, a witness that he honors even as he says he's come to fill it full. In his teaching, his own obedience to God, his obedience will go even as far as the suffering death on the cross for the sake of others. Matthew is always eager to show how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, and so he places Jesus on a mountaintop just as Moses received the law on a mountaintop. And Jesus in the rest of chapter 5 speaks out commands that are filled full of meaning based on the Old Testament for his disciples. These words will stand the test of time, he says. Words that will never, ever pass away, even when heaven and earth pass away. Asserting his authority, apart from other sources, Jesus gives six commands using the words, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. And his commands in Matthew 5 broaden and deepen and widen and round out those Old Testament commands. He talks about murder and marriage and divorce and retribution and oaths and loving enemies and he cuts right into the heart of the matter. Jesus' commands are both simpler than the teaching of the Pharisees and 
harder to fulfill. They're simpler because they're straightforward. They cut through the tradition built up around the Old Testament law. And they're harder because they require not only outward obedience, outward conformity to an external standard, but also require an inward willingness of the heart. There was quite a tradition around these laws. Around the 613 commands in the Old Testament, the oral tradition of the Pharisees grew to guard the special sacredness of the Torah, God's law. When it was written down, that oral tradition totaled 800 pages. And rabbis then discussed the teachings around those commentaries to create more teachings, more fence posts to tighten the spaces that might allow people to wiggle out from obedience to the commands. So when Jesus says that the disciples' righteousness must surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, you can imagine those disciples looking around the circle at each other, wide-eyed, discouraged after hearing such a standard. The Pharisees had already raised the intensity around righteousness to stratospheric heights. How could anybody possibly aspire to be more righteous than they were? Yet at the same time as the traditions around the Old Testament became more and more specific, it also became clear that those commandments and the fences around them could never go quite far enough to have the desired result. They could not ensure changed hearts and transformed lives. Later in Matthew, Jesus addresses the Pharisees saying, woe to you. Pharisees and teachers of the law, hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. For changed hearts and transformed lives, lives that keep the weightier matters of the law without neglecting the smaller matters, the smaller acts of obedience, something else is needed. And if we're inclined to be too hard on the Pharisees and their attempts to safeguard the value of righteous living, it's good to note it's not just the Pharisees who build up laws to expand rules and regulations. This is a human impulse that we have when we see things not going well. It's human for us to swing between two poles, regulation and deregulation. We've got lots of rules in place. We live that way for a while. We want to be freer of those things. We deregulate because we want to live a fully human, authentic existence. We live through the consequences of that. Doesn't always go very well. And we come back to more regulation. In his book, After You Believe, N.T. Wright describes the aftermath of the financial crash in 2008. After that happened, Wright says, a lot of people pointed to the fact that over the previous 20 years, all kinds of rules and regulations that had previously been in place to stop the banks and other money lending institutions from behaving irresponsibly had quietly been set aside. They were over-restrictive, the politicians had been told. And so everybody went along for the ride, not realizing that they were accelerating toward the edge of a cliff. So afterward, people were saying, we need to put all the rules and regulations back in place to keep this working. Wright continues, we need to notice that our culture has lurched between deregulation in key areas of life money, sex, and power, to put it crudely, and what you might call re-regulation. Deregulation happened because people wanted to, be their, wanted to do their own thing. But when deregulation results in chaos, whether in banking and human relationships, 
or the way we do politics, people, people are eager to reintroduce rules that will get us back on track. The problem is that introducing new rules and regulations doesn't get to the heart of the problem. Doing your own thing isn't good enough. Rules by themselves won't solve the problem. Instead, keeping our systems, our families, our churches, our financial institutions, our businesses running requires people who can be trusted to do the right thing. Not because there are rules, but because that's the kind of people they are. That's the kind of people they are. People who are receiving and inhabiting the character of Christ. Jesus comes not simply to give us a new set of rules, an external standard based on his own authority, although he would have every right to do that. He comes to do something even better. He comes to love us to death. As we receive the grace that he demonstrates to us in his death and resurrection, he starts to remake our hearts. He doesn't do away with God's commands. He fulfills them through his own obedience, through his own teaching, through his own life. A life unlike any other seen on this earth. And so if we find ourselves following Jesus' commands to the letter, desiring to do that, but finding that we're doing it in a way that doesn't actually look very much like the Jesus of the Gospels, we might pause and notice that and reflect. Is it the Lord that we're following? If we're meeting the outward requirements of Jesus' commands, but not seeing love and joy and peace and forbearance, kindness, faithfulness develop in our hearts, it's possible that we've left something behind on our journey with Jesus. And on the other hand, if we think that we can rest easy in the grace of God in Christ, because after all, he fulfilled the law and finished the work, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If we do that too easily, we need the corrective lens of Matthew's Jesus. Because this Jesus has authority. He does command. His commands are the red carpeted path laid out for us for walking as a redeemed people. They are the pattern and the form of life lived in the kingdom of heaven. So which opposite danger is more troublesome for you? Legalism or license? As we navigate between those opposing dangers, we do that in a community of people with the help of the Spirit and the help of our Lord and teacher and elder brother and substitute sufferer and merciful judge. In Matthew 22, the Pharisees ask Jesus if he'll identify the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, Jesus says. This is the first and greatest command commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. This love for God is born not of fear of punishment. This love is moved by grace, grace given, grace received, grace that remakes people in ways like any other performance system this world has to offer. The obedience of Jesus' followers is a grateful obedience to a law already filled full in Christ. When we say yes to the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we begin to spend time with him. We begin to learn his ways, what he commands, and how he does it. He makes us people that are signposts of his kingdom, the people we've always wanted to be, people who find ourselves wanting to walk with him, people who are thirsty for his teaching, 
people who are eager to practice and to do the things he says. Here's an example of what this might look like in a workplace environment. Captain Chesley Sullenberger, Sullenberger, or Sully, as he is known, is an airline pilot who received national recognition about 15 years ago. He was able to safely land a passenger plane on the Hudson River after hitting a bird and taking out an engine on the plane. Sully had practiced piloting for years. He knew the rules for flying planes. He knew the skills. He had the technical experience and expertise. And so he knew in a situation that went beyond the flight book, in circumstances far less, far more harrowing than any that he'd trained under, he was able to respond, to behave appropriately, to work in a way that showed the skill and the practice of being a veteran pilot. He was able to do what came to him, second nature, as it were. So too are the people yoked with Christ by his grace. In him, with their participation and agreement, Jesus begins to form character that truly looks like him. Even if it's in fits and starts, and ebbs and flows throughout the seasons of our lives. Jesus grants us a new second nature, recreating us as people able to respond in a Christ-like way in situations that depart from the specifics of his commands. Christ came to us overflowing with life. Life lived in perfect obedience to God. And on us, Jesus' followers, some of that filled to the brim faithfulness of Jesus has splashed out on us. We saw that in baptism this morning. We're washed. We taste and drink of his faithfulness at his table. We long to be full of his faithfulness ourselves so that the fruit of the Savior's life, a life that looks like the kingdom of God, begins to grow in us too. Thanks be to God. Lord our God, your purposes for us and for this world are beyond our imagining. You call us to be participants who love you first and best and most and who inhabit the kingdom you're forming. Give us the grace um, to approach you with humility, the grace to approach others with love, the grace to trust that you are working forever and ever. Amen.